All right, there we go. All right, go away. Go ahead, Diane. <laughs> All right. Well, th again, thank you very much for um, everybody for coming. Um, I'm going to ask everyone to mute now so that any background noise doesn't uh, disrupt the presentation. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so here we are. This is Nest Watch. Um, we have started this um, for the first time last year. Um, we have 48 uh, bluebird boxes on the property between the Bucks Audubon property and the Tuckamone Tree Farm property. And we had never really done anything with monitoring them, seeing how many were successful or um, anything of that nature. So when we started the Citizen Science Committee, this seemed like just the, uh, the perfect project to get us going on seeing how we do with our nest boxes. Nest Watch is um, a nationwide program. It is run by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and it does um, ha has been monitoring nests for decades. Um, the previous years before they came into the electronic age, uh, volunteers used Nest Watch cards and sent them in to Cornell. Um, currently, they are working on getting all of that manual data into their um, electronic form. So if anybody's interested in doing data entry, I believe they're looking for volunteers to help, you know, enter some of that historical data. But even with that, you know, there's a, there's a great, it's a great way to monitor how populations are changing over time. Um, if things like climate change, um, land use changes, um, things like that are, are impacting uh, how the birds are breeding. And it doesn't cost anything, which is always, which is always nice. Now, I know for those of you that have, got, have some nerves about this, um, this part of the code of conduct is to try and make it so you feel a little more comfortable with you know, having to approach a nest. So, you know, we want to minimize any risks that we're um, impacting the nest with. So we want to avoid accidental harm. We want the parents to be, feel safe in their nests. And we certainly don't want to do anything that will attract predators to a nest. Now, this presentation on Nest Watch is for nest boxes that we use. However, if you have nesting birds on your property and you want to use this um, with your own Nest Watch account, to, to keep track of any birds that may, may be nesting where you live, you can do that too. The approach to a non-box um, nest is, is the same, although you'll have to hunt for the nest in order to find it. Whereas, you know, once we have the nest boxes, you know where the nest boxes are, you don't have to do too much hunting. So the code of conduct involves these steps. Um, you need to know what the nesting cycle of birds is so that you know when it is safe and not safe to visit. Um, prepare for visiting the nests, make sure you go at the right time. The searching carefully is for nests that aren't in boxes. We don't have to search, we know where our boxes are. Although if you've never been to the site, you may have to search to find your boxes, um, but they're all, they're all pretty um, obvious. I'll show you a map later on in the presentation of where they are. Approaching the nest with care, of course, is something you wanna do. You don't wanna disturb the nest unless it's a, a nest that shouldn't be there, and we'll get into that at the end too. Of course, not handling the eggs or, the, or any nestlings that might be in there. Respecting um, private property, you don't have to worry about that because it's our property and, and you'll be fine. Not leaving a dead end trail, we'll talk about what that means. And then of course, understanding the Migratory Bird Treaty um, basically has to do with protecting the birds. So the code of conduct, let's start with learning about the nesting cycle of birds. If you don't know about the nesting cycle of birds, there's lots of places you can look um, allaboutbirds.org is the Cornell site that teaches about birds. There's lots of information in various guidebooks. And I also have a presentation that I can send to you, which if you decide after the presentation you do in fact want to participate, um, I can send that out to you. It goes through, um, you know, site selection, breeding, nest building, all that stuff. So planning and preparing. Um, we want people to go twice a week. Um, but if you can't make it twice a week, at least once a week is okay. Um, prepare your materials beforehand. 
Uh, we'll go over the data sheet so you'll be familiar with it. And this is important. You want to go to the nest, take your, get your observation, and leave within a minute. So that means you're not going to be, you know, standing around writing on your on your clipboard while you're standing there. You're going to take your observation and walk away so that you can fill out your data later. All right, when is it appropriate to visit a nest? You don't want to check early in the morning. It's too cold. Um, birds haven't eaten yet. Um, it's not a good time for them to, to visit. <coughs> Excuse me. Don't go during the first few days of incubation. Sometimes that's a little tricky. You know, you're you're going every three or four days. You watch the nest being built for the you know for days and days. It's empty, and then all of a sudden there's eggs in it. So you know, how do you know when the first few days of incubation are? I can tell you how you can approximate when the first egg is laid. Um, and most of the birds that we'll be monitoring um, don't really don't start incubating um, full on until all of their eggs are laid. So that, that's the, so that the birds um, hatch at about the same time. So it, it cuts down a little bit on the competition between the young. And you certainly don't want to check when the young are close to fledging because you could startle them out of the nest before they're really ready to leave. And one of the things about uh, you know using Nest Watch is that you know you can, when you know when the eggs are laid, you can and you know when they hatch, then you can estimate when they're going to be close to fledging, and you can um, either not open the nest box to look, or you can use another device to try and check with. And I'll I'll talk about that a little bit too. You don't want to go when it's cold and rainy. You don't want the birds to get cold, um, and certainly we don't go at night or at dusk. Um, because the birds are trying to get in there and be safe, you know, from the, the beasts in the nest. Searching carefully, we don't have to worry about. So this little diagram at the bottom here is um, about not leaving a dead end trail. When you approach a nest box, you don't want to go in and out. You're going to wear a path to the, to the nest box and, you know, predators are smart. They're going to figure that out, that there's something going on here, something of interest. So you want to kind of do a swing by, you know, go in, from one direction, do your check and leave, you know, walking away from in the other direction. It's easy. Generally, um, when the nests are clear of brush and so forth, if there's a, a nest that you've been assigned to that you can't access this way, let us know. Um, we've got volunteers that can help clear away brush. Or if you'd like to do your own um, upkeep, you know, you can clear brush away as well. Okay, minimizing disturbance of the nest. One of the things um, that we don't do is sneak up on the nest. You don't, you want to let the bird know that you're coming. So, you know, make a little bit of noise, whistle a tune, um, so that when you actually get to the box, the bird's not startled. They've heard you coming. Um, if you when you get to the next box, give it a little tap on the side and then tap it again when you open the box. If the bird is sitting on her eggs and doesn't leave when you tap on the box, that's fine. Just leave her there. If that means you can't, you know, figure out how many eggs she's sitting on that particular visit, don't worry about it. You'll get them the next time. Um, we don't handle eggs or birds. Um, we have a couple of long handled mirrors to view the nest if it's above your sight line. Um, if you're short like me, that's most of them. So um, we have long handled mirrors for that. And certainly um, don't disturb any nestlings. So respecting private land, again, with um, working with us, you don't have to worry about that. You're welcome to, uh, to be on our property and to be doing this work. Understanding the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. I think that's our next slide. Yeah. OK, so it's unlawful to take, possess, all that stuff um, of any migratory bird. Um, so that includes the birds that will be in our boxes. In our boxes, we get bluebirds, tree swallows, chickadees, tip mice, um, house wrens. Those are the main ones that we that we get. All of those birds are protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So you cannot touch or physically disturb an active nest or its contents. However, look at the last line. House sparrows and starlings are not protected by the act because they're invasive exotic species. So we'll talk a little bit about what to do if a house sparrow um, gets in your nest. Generally, we don't have starlings. We maintain our boxes so the entry hole for the box is really too small for a starling to fit into. Um, and fortunately, we don't have too many house sparrows on the property, um, so we haven't really had to, to deal with this too much. 
Um, but occasionally, you know, we'll get we'll get a half sparrow, and then we'll have to worry about how we can prevent the breeding in the box. Okay, so this is probably of great interest to you all. These are what nests look like. Um, any of these can be in a box. So the eastern bluebird, which is you know what everybody hopes to get because they're so pretty, um, they make their nests in grasses. Okay, they make a very nice, neat nest with a nice round bowl in it. Um, Carolina chickadees use a lot of moss and they have those kind of cute speckled eggs. Carolina wrens, um, they're a little bit messier and they will nest just about anywhere. Um, I've had them nesting in my garage in an old boot, in an old a flower pot, um, in, on the back on my back deck in the uh, inside on the inside cover of my propane tank. So Carolina wrens are very opportunistic in where they nest, but you can identify their nest by how messy they are. Um, tree swallows, they like to use their feathers to line the nest. They use um, somewhat stiffer materials, larger, larger kind of grass stems and sticks. Tip, oops, sorry. Tip mice, um, again, they use some moss. They have uh, speckled eggs as well. And then the house wrens, they use sticks. Um, they tend to fill up the box quite a bit, so you may have trouble actually seeing into the nest because the nest is so high. And they have those very small brown eggs. Okay, so those are the ones that we generally see in our boxes. So what kind of risks are we, are we having with our um, nests? So, of course, there's always the present risk of abandonment. If you have eggs in a nest and you don't see the parents, that's probably okay. Um, I've visited my nest many times and saw no sign of the parents um, and the eggs progressed and fledged just fine. Um, sometimes I saw the parents, sometimes I didn't. So if you go a month with no um, activity around the nest, then you, can, you, can, you might be able to assume that it's been abandoned. I would go six weeks personally, um, but you know, Nest Watch says one month is enough. Predators that we need to worry about, um, snakes, raccoons, squirrels, um, cats. We don't have to worry too much about cats um, on the property, but the others we do in fact have. Squirrels like to try and take over boxes, snake and climb up the poles. Um, and then we have competitors. Some competition is, um, is acceptable, even though it's heartbreaking. I had one of my nests last year had a bluebird nest in it with two eggs and um, a house wren successfully fought off the bluebirds and took over that box. So they, um, those, those two eggs um, became non-viable and the, the house wrens had a successful boot in that box. And because house wrens are native, there was nothing to be done about it except celebrate the birth of new house, house wrens. If we do have house sparrows, um, there's a couple of things that can be done. You can remove the nest um, and hope that another bird takes it over. But the chances are, if you remove that nest and um, the house sparrow is really got its heart set on that particular box, it's going to just come back and rebuild the nest. So my preference is to let them go ahead and build the nest in the box, lay their eggs, and then disturb the eggs. A couple of ways you can make eggs non-viable is you can oil them. I don't like oiling particularly because um, that, that leaves an odor and the, the net sparrows may abandon that nest and build a different one. Uh, my preference is for addling, which basically is taking the eggs out of the nest and shaking them to uh, disrupt the, uh, the developing embryo, putting it back in the nest. Um, the sparrows will continue to sit on those eggs, and but they won't hatch. So that box will be out of commission for that nesting season, but uh, we won't be bringing any more um, exotic invasive species to the area. So it's it's a hard job. There's no question about it. It's, it's, it's disturbing to have to do this. Um, but by the same token, you know these birds aren't supposed to be here. They're taking territory away from the native birds. Um, that support our environment. So, you know, it needs to be done. So if this is something that you don't think you can do, um, but you still want to participate, 
you know, what you can do is, you know, let me know that you think you've got a house sparrow nest. And if necessary, I will go and take care of it for you. All right. Any questions about any of that? Any questions at any time, just go ahead and put them in the chat and we'll, uh, we'll, get, we'll get to them. Okay, so this is a house sparrow nest. It's got some grass, it's got some moss, but take a look at those eggs. They're a completely different um, looking sort of egg than a bluebird egg. They do look a little bit similar to titmice eggs. So you have to be careful that you're not inadvertently disturbing a, a titmouse um, nest. Um, but you have, if you have any questions about who's living in your box, you know, just let us know and uh, we'll take a look at it and try and make sure that it is in fact a species that we don't want. This is a starling nest. Um, you can see that in this particular case, the bowl of the nest is towards the back of the box. You can see it's not nicely centered like a, like a bluebird nest is. Um, it does have some feathers in it like a, like a tree swallow does, but again, the nest is offset to the back of the box. Um, it does have eggs that are slightly more pointed at one end than um, the regular, regular bluebird eggs that we see. So again, um, we don't generally have a problem with starlings because the nest box openings are small enough that the starlings really can't use the box. But by the same token, some, some of the boxes over the winter have been you know, used by squirrels as a place to stay warm over the winter. So the openings might have gotten a little bit bigger. But when you get your nest box assignments, um, if you see anything that makes you uncomfortable, like the, the opening has been chewed on or you think it's a little too big, um, you know, let us know and we can put a new predator guard over the top and make sure it has the right size opening. One of the things that, you know, and we'll talk about this when we get to the data sheet, but one of the things that you can, you'll do when you first um, get your nest assignments is to take some measurements. How high is the box? Um, how big is the opening? Um, and so forth. So this is a starling nest. Then of course we have our mice. Um, mouse nests tend to fill up the box with highly divided um, junky looking material. They chew stuff up, um, stuff the box full, and then they bury themselves in the, inside the material. So it's, uh, it's fairly obvious that it's a mouse nest. Um, and again, if you have any questions about whether you're, you know, you're dealing with, with mice or potentially a bird, um, just let us know and we can come out with you and look at it with you or, or just take care of it. The mice are cute. You know, we, let the, we let them live in the boxes over the winter. Um, there's one particular box that almost always has mice in it over the winter time. And uh, however, we have since evicted them all, um, which is not to say that they won't try and get back in but they've since been evicted and the boxes have been cleaned. So hopefully when you go to your box for the first time, you don't find mice. Um, this is another possibility. Brown-headed cowbirds um, do not make their own nests. They lay their eggs in the nests of other birds and their young are raised by the host parents. There's nothing to be done about this either. Cowbirds are native. Um, it is part of their adaptive strategy. They, um, they evolve to follow herd animals. So since they're following herd animals as they move amongst the grasslands, um, they couldn't be sitting on a nest because they're, they would lose their food source. So they lay their eggs in the nests of other birds that do in fact stay stationary. And then their young are raised by those um, other parents. Generally speaking, when cowbirds are hatched, they're bigger and more competitive than the young in the nest. Um, so they do tend to win out in, in the competition phase of, of growing up. But it's a native bird and there isn't anything we can do about it. it. They are protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Well, before we get to that, one other thing that may happen, I know Ken mentioned ants. Um, I had wasps. Um, other people have had bees. So um, those are things that need to be, you know, removed from the box. Um, generally speaking, um, you know, if, if you're concerned about being stung, what you can do is open the side of the box and leave it open. The, what, what the insects and um, what the ants and the bees and the wasps like is the fact that it's closed in. 
So you can leave the box wide open for you know a few days and they will leave um, and then you can close it up again. But we don't use any kind of pesticide to get rid of the ants or the or any other insect that might have taken a precedence because that kind of um, chemical can be detrimental to the birds that may eventually decide that they want to use that box. So we try to use non-chemical methods of um, disruption for those those creatures. Any questions about any of that? All right. So this is the protocol. Find a nest. Again, in this case, you're going to be finding a box. Um, you'll have your map, so you don't have to remember because you can look at your map. Um, we will create the nest watch sites um, for you so that you don't have to worry about that part. Check the nest every couple of a couple, three, four days, record your observations. Um, and when you get towards the end of the life of the nest, when the young have fledged, you want to visit the nest one last time to make sure everybody's gone out of the nest. And then you'll enter what your what your summary of the site was. When you've done that, I suggest, I recommend that you then remove the nesting material and dispose of it, especially if it's early enough in the nesting season, because if, uh, if a pair have been successful in a particular location, they may want to use it again and do it and raise a second brood. One of my, um, nest, actually two of my nest boxes did raise two broods um, last summer. So it's good to get, and they won't reuse a nest. There's um, there's mites and you know other material that is in that old nest that are not is not healthy for the birds to reuse it. So if we clean the box out for them, you know dispose of the nest material far away from where the nest is, so that there's no um, chance a predator is going to find it and figure it out, um, and then the birds can reuse that nest box. So. Visiting the boxes, approach it properly. We talked about that a little bit. You want to um, come from one direction, be efficient, um, spend less than a minute, and then walk away. Um, not an out and back, kind of a, a flyby, if you will. And then record your data um, on your checklist, on your um, check sheet, not when you're standing by the nest. OK, so estimating dates. So you go to your nest on a Monday and there's no eggs and you visit your nest again on a Thursday and there's two eggs. So you go, oh, how am I going to know when the first egg date was? So if you assume an egg a day, because that's fairly typical for songbirds, you can go backwards two days and that will be the date of your first egg. So it laid an egg the day after you after you visited. Um, Hatch date, again, you can estimate by how long the birds have been incubating for. And then fledge date, again, you can estimate. And but depending on the species you have, we can tighten up those dates a little bit tighter to, in terms of how much time those, those um, nestlings will spend in the nest. And this is data that you will, are going to want to record on your uh, check sheet. This is the nest check data sheet. Um, you'll record the year, the species once once you figure it out. Um, our nest sites, our nest boxes are all numbered. Um, and we'll, you'll see that on the map. And then as you, as you go down to where the breeding data gets entered, you can see that they've given you an example of how to record the data. Those codes in the boxes for um, nest status, adult status, and all that stuff is all explained on the back side of the nest check data sheet. So you don't have to memorize it. It's all, it'll all be there. OK, so one of the things, I'll go back just a second. One of the things that you're going to be recording under description is where the nest is located. Nest substrate basically is where is the nest relative to the surface on where it is. So you've got snags, live tree cavities, all of ours will be nest boxes or birdhouses. However, if you're going to do any of this nest watch stuff on your own property, this is useful for you to know in terms of what kind of a nest um, surface the nest is in, on, or under. Then we've got our habitat description codes 
Generally speaking, for us, um, you can use public park or green space. Um, I use Christmas tree farm because I, I monitor the boxes over on Tuckamone and that is a Christmas tree farm. Um, you can also have agricultural areas. Some of our boxes are closer to the woods and if you feel comfortable calling it a woodland area, that's fine. Um, and some of our boxes are on what we call our ag fields. So if you are comfortable calling that an agricultural area, you can call it that too. So here's our map. This is probably not really clear on your screen, um, but if you look, um, let's see, in the lower right hand corner where all the M's are, that is our Bluebird Meadow. Um, you can see the number of boxes we have there. Um, they start with M1, 2, and 3 along the roadway and then carry on through the meadow. Um, there are a bunch of them on the other side of the road marked with G's. That's because they're close to the organic garden. Um, there's a, a, a V, which is the box that's right by the parking lot, by the visitor center, and so on. The, the A labeled boxes are in the, the ag fields. And then the ones over in the area that's outlined by a dashed line are over on Tuckamone Tree Farm. The ones on Tuckamone Tree Farm um, are, are done by myself and um, Robert Timmons um, because we're visiting, generally speaking, when the residents of that area are present and we just wanna keep them comfortable with who's wandering around on the property um, while they're home. So that's what the nest looks like. That's what the nest watch map looks like. All right. Before we get to the quiz, I'm gonna stop sharing this and I'm gonna show you guys a little video um, so that you can see the way I approach my nest boxes. So you can get comfortable with how that's done. Let me stop that. Um, while I have you here, I'm gonna show you um, the mirror. Um, it's on a telescoping handle, so you can make it really very long. Okay, and then you can use this to look in your, um, your nests. The other thing that I, because I'm a geek, the other thing that I did was I purchased for myself an endoscope that um, is Bluetooth enabled and goes to my, um, my iPhone so that I can actually use it not, to, not only to see into the nest and light it up, but to actually take pictures. Um, so if anybody, it costs about 20 bucks. So if anybody is geeky like me and wants to, to buy yourself one of those, let me know and I can get you the information. I just got it on Amazon. All right, before I go to the video, I'm gonna check the chat to see what kind of questions we have. So a question, um, oh, okay. So a question, will we see mice in the box? It's possible. Sometimes you see them. Um, and uh, okay, so you saw the house sparrow nest. Okay, so um, we'll go to the video. Okay, so here we are. Let's share this. Can everybody see this that says nest box monitor project? Nod your head yes. Shake your head no. Everybody can see this? Okay, let's play it. Hello again. It's Friday, April 10th. This is Miss Diane visiting my nest boxes. Once again, going to nest box T1 over on Tuckamone. When I was here Tuesday without my camera, the nest had three eggs in it. So we're going to take a look now and see if there's any more, if the parents were here. When I was here Tuesday, both parents were here going in and out of the box. And let's see what's going on now. You can hear me tapping on the box. So you can see how fast I did that. I walked up, 
tapped on the box, opened it, took a look, um, closed up the box. It took roughly 25 seconds. Moving in a different direction than when I approached, trying to keep any scent trails away from predators so predators don't attach themselves to the nest area. So, April 14th, approaching nest box T0. There was some nest material in this one previously. Very much look like a complete nest. So we'll take a look and see if we've got Next box T1. I don't know if you saw that, but it looks like Mama just flew out of the box as I was approaching. Daddy flew away. So we're going to take a walk up and we'll approach the way we always do slowly, carefully, but not to alarm anyone, just to let them know we're coming. So here we are. Knock on the box. Okay, so that one took 20 seconds, um, and that's how it's done. It's really very, very straightforward. Um, can you get a copy of the presentation? Sure, I can do that. I can send that out, um, and you can review it. Um, the nest with the pine needles, that was also um, a bluebird nest. So they will use grasses, they will use pine needles, um, anything, anything kind, of, kind of material like that. All right, so I'm gonna share the screen again and it's time for your quiz. The quiz that we're gonna be doing is um, Nest Watch certification. Um, I'm not gonna grade you on it. I'm gonna let you grade yourselves um, and we can talk about any of the answers that are unclear or that you wanna further discuss. All right, so here we go. I'll share this again. Okay, so of course it went back to the beginning because it didn't want to stay where I had it. There we go. Okay. So question number one, when searching for or monitoring nests, you should be careful to A, avoid accidentally harming nests, B, causing adult birds to desert their nests, C, attracting predators, or D, all of the above. All right, who wants to answer this one? All right, Ken, you answer this one. I would say uh, D. Very good. D is correct. Does anybody have a different answer than D that we need to talk about? You can uh, raise your hand or unmute yourself or whichever you want to do. All right. I think I emphasized this next one enough, but let's ask it anyway. <laughs> How much time should be spent at a nest during a typical check? A minute or less? About Five minutes, about 10 minutes, or more than 10 minutes. Kathy, okay. go ahead and answer this one. One minute or less. Minute or less. OK. Generally speaking, when is the best time for visiting nests? Early in the morning, in the afternoon, at dusk, or at night? Susie, answer this one. B, in the afternoon. Correct. Before you begin searching for and monitoring nests, you should Learn about the nests that breed in your air, birds that breed in your area. Have a general understanding of the nesting cycle of birds. Read and understand the Nest Watch Code of Conduct and Nest Monitoring Protocol, or D, all of the above. <laughs> Sandy. Unmute. Unmute yourself, Sandy. 
all of the above do excellent excellent okay all right you can minimize disturbance to a nest by all of the following except watching the nest from a distance and waiting for the adults to leave just sneaking up soft softly whistling or singing a song before approaching the nest sneaking up on the nest or gently tapping on the side of the box before opening it i heard somebody chime in with the answer see Correct. Don't sneak. No sneaking. You don't want the birds to be surprised when you get there. You want them to know you're coming. The first time you encounter an active nest, you should place brightly colored flagging nearby so you can easily relocate it. Notify your nearest wildlife conservation office. Accurately record the nest location and leave the area as soon as possible or D, photograph the nest from several angles. Heidi, which one? Um, we say C. Yes, C is correct. <laughs> All right. In general, nest should not be checked. Oops, come on, stop doing that. Nest should not be checked. Where was I? Where, where, where am I? Where am I? Where, 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 where? Don't do that to me. <laughs> Let me go back. Okay, go back. Here we are. Here we are. Sorry. In general, nests should not be checked during the first few days of incubation in cold or rainy weather when the young are close to fledging or all of the above. Margie. <laughs> D, all of the above. Correct. To properly balance bird safety and data accuracy, active nests should be visited every day, every three or four days, every two weeks, or once per month. Somebody chime in and go ahead and answer this one. B. <laughs> Very good. You guys are paying attention. I love it. All right. Um, during nest checks, you should not handle birds or eggs because it's against the law. Eggs and nestlings can be easily injured. You may attract the attention of a nest predator or all of the above. D. Oh. Who said, who said which? I did not hear that well. Uh, Mary Jo, I said D. D is correct, all of the above. When visiting a nest, it is best to use the same path every time, use a different path every time, Leave a dead end path to the nest, or D, none of the above. Kate. Uh, I'm not leaving, uh, I have to back into this. I'm not leaving a dead end. Uh, I'm not using, I'm using the same path every time. A. No? Did you say A? Yeah. Does, does, do you guys agree with A? B. Use D is correct. Correct. Oh. You want to use as different a path as possible. Obviously, when you're using when you're doing a nest box, you're going to have to approximate the same path, but yeah. try to be as variable as you can because you really don't want to beat down on any kind of vegetation that may be approaching it. You want to not send trail. So you want to try and um, make as you know as varied an approach as you can. And that's the end of that. So I think you guys all pass. And now it's time for questions. What, what is the height of the boxes? Um, generally speaking, they're about five feet. Okay, because I'm five one. I just wondered if I should bring a stool. <laughs> <laughs> well, the ground, is, the ground can be fairly uneven. So, I mean, if you want to try using bringing a stool, you can. Um, I would recommend the uh, mirror approach. And, and we can want, if, get our own or we borrow that from the uh, center? Um, the, way, the way this works is I will have, once, I, once we get our nest box assignments, there will be clipboards in our bird seed shed. Um, on the property, there's a 24-7 bird seed shed. There'll be a box um, that says nest watch on it. Um, 
there will be a clipboard for each of you with data check sheets for each of your nests. This will be this will be in there. I have two of these. I think one is one's probably at the center. Um, you can grab your clipboard, grab your mirror, and then be off on your way to check your nests. So um, you'll you'll record your data and then put the check the uh, check sheets back in the box. And then um, we generally generally speaking, I only have a couple of people doing data entry into the electronic system just for consistency's sake. If any of you want to do your own data entry, let me know and I'll be more than happy to let you do your own data entry. Um, okay, are ticks an issue when checking boxes? Yes, ticks are always an issue whenever you're outside anywhere. So um, doing a tick check when you're done is absolutely the best idea ever. Um, so definitely you know, do a tick check when you're done. How do the boxes open, the fronts of the boxes? You, most of them open from the side. Um, the, side. the T0 that I showed you in that little video is the only one I know of for sure that opens from the front. Um, generally speaking, there's a little um, kind of bent nail sort of lever on the side. You twist it down and then the, um, there's, a, there's like two nails for the, to hinge up. So you can pick it up from the, from the side and lift it up. If anybody wants to um, have, you know, somebody accompany them when you go to your first box check to make sure that you know you're opening it right, you're comfortable with it. Keep in mind that you know nesting season um, hasn't really started yet. Um, my box T1 was the first one to get um, any nesting material in it last year, and that happened the first week of April, which is why we're starting the first week of April. Last year we started in the middle of March and it was cold and it was rainy and it was two weeks of nothing. So, so um, I decided to back it off a little bit this year and go for you know the first week of April because that seemed to be about the earliest that we were gonna get any action. So, um, but if, like I said, if anybody wants you know company when they're going, let me know and we'll, we'll see if we can get you some company to go with. So, so time of day, would that be noon to 5 p.m. ideally? Um, I, you can, you could back it up a little bit. You don't want to go early in the morning, but certainly as the weather gets nicer and warmer, um, you know, anytime after 10 o'clock is probably fine. Um, and then, you know, five o'clock would be the latest I would leave it. Um, cause especially as the summer wears on and we're starting to get into August, you know, it's, it's getting a little later in the day in terms of temperature is probably fine, but in terms of darkness, um, you know, that gets a little bit. Okay, so what is our best source of photos um, for different types of nests and eggs? And do we need to ID on your info sheets? Yes. Um, you will be, be identifying your um, nests on your info sheet. You need to identify your species. The best ever way to identify a nest and the eggs is to see the adults going in and out of the box. That kind of you know, is the, the absolute unmistakable way to identify the bird. Um, Bluebirds are very distinctive. Tree swallows are very distinctive. Even house wrens, you know, little brown birds that they are, are fairly distinctive. Um, everybody knows what a chickadee looks like. Um, if you need any help with bird ID, absolutely, I can get you pictures of the birds. Um, uh, somebody asked previously for a copy of this presentation. Um, I can certainly email you guys if you're interested in carrying on. I can email you the presentation and the pictures, you know, for the various nests are, are on the slides. So you can certainly use that. Um, so, you know, there aren't that many different birds that are going to be using the boxes. So it's not like you have to memorize a ton of different kinds of nests and eggs. Um, they're, they're fairly straightforward. Will, will you make a schedule or do we tell you when we're coming? How does that work? You are on your own for scheduling it. I will give you the boxes that you are to monitor and then it's up to you to work it in with whatever else is going on in your life. You know, as long as you can make it every three or four days, twice a week sort of thing, that's fine. So you'll, you'll come to the center, you'll pick up your clipboard, you know, you'll go check your boxes, you'll enter your data and you put the clipboard back in the seed shed. Um, I'll be picking them up probably around once a week and entering the data. 
um, myself or, or Sally Conine, one of our, our board members, she likes to help with the stuff. I know one of us will be entering the data probably up weekly. Otherwise it gets to be, it piles up too much. And then if, if say we're going on vacation for a week, you said just let you know? Mm -hmm. Yes, we ha I had some folks go on vacation last week. They let me know. Um, and either I or another one of the members here, you know, who is you know, amenable to it, will um, check the boxes for you and record the data on your data sheets. Does anybody want another look at that data sheet? I can go. I can go back, or you can review it um, when when you get the copy of the presentation. When you're looking at your clipboards, you know the the data sheets have got all of the um, the, the abbreviations on them. If any of them are not clear, you know when you read it and you want some clarification, again you can just let me know. I think they're reasonably straightforward, um, but the first time you look at it, it can be a little daunting. So, you know, let me know. Is it possible to send us like an attachment, like on an email of the data sheet so we can read it before we get there the first, I mean, it looked like there's a lot of stuff on there. Yeah, there is a lot of stuff on there. Um, <laughs> I will scan, I will scan both sides of one in and, you know, attach it. That's, that's, a, good, that's a good thought. I will do that. I, I just found it on the website because you had the link and it downloaded to my folder. So we should all have yeah. it on nestwatch.org, yeah, right, Diane? Yes, you can you can do that as well. You can go to nestwatch.org and the the you know the data check sheet is fairly easy to, to access. Um, but I can also scan it in. All the right. deadline for confirming participation in the program from the, the chat. Um, I would like to know no later than five o'clock Wednesday of this coming week if you want to continue um, so that I can have some time to put the uh, put the nest box assignments together and get it out to you all in time for the following week. All right. All right. Anything else? Hi, I'm Carrie. Um, yes, Carrie. Having never done this, when you open the box, <laughs> I felt myself pulling back having never done it. Um, <laughs> Like, oh, you know, um, is there anything, does that ever happen when there's some kind of surprise when you open it or is it pretty? If you, if you, if you knock on the box, you yeah. won't be surprised when you open okay. it. You okay. will be surprised when you knock on the box though. So I've had that happen, okay. which is one of the reasons why you always want to approach from the side. If you approach from the front and the bird startles and flies out of the box, it's going to fly right into your face. So always approach from the side. Yes, it is. It is a little bit startling when you're walking up and you're like, you know, you know, a foot away from the box and then the bird just bursts out of the box, you know, in an explosion of flight. And it's like, oh, yes, you, you do jump back a little bit. Um, generally, I've, I have never had um, a box that I opened and the bird did not move. Um, I know some birds do sit on the nest when you open the box. That has never happened to me. Every time I've approached the box, the bird has left either when I was approaching or when I knocked on the box. Um, they've never stayed through me opening the box. When I switched over to the endoscope and then put that through the opening um, instead of opening the box, um, which, which is a safer bet for when the chicks are getting close to fledging because you know they cannot fly out of the opening when you've got an endoscope through it. Um, I still didn't have any situations where the, the parents were sitting on the nest. They always left before I you know, took a good look at the nest. Which is not to say it couldn't happen. One, one of you may get lucky and have that happen, but it never happened to me. So, I mean, there's no guarantee you're gonna get any nests in your boxes. There's no guarantee if you do get um, eggs that they're gonna hatch. That box T0, which was on the video, um, that nest, which didn't have any eggs in it at the end of the video, did get two bluebird eggs. And then um, there was a battle between the house wrens and the bluebirds, and the house wrens won. And so those two bluebird eggs became non viable because the house wrens built their nest on top of the bluebird nest. Um, and they laid seven eggs and they all fledged. 
So while I didn't have bluebirds out of that box, I did have house wrens. Oh, I was thinking they'd all be occupied. So what, what's the occupancy rate? <laughs> the occupancy rate, yeah, probably 25%. Hmm. So you may have, you know, no boxes occupied. You may have all your boxes occupied. Um, looking at the map of which ones were occupied, it was scattered all over. There wasn't really any particular habitat preference um, amongst, you know, where the boxes were situated. Um, we did have one of our boxes, you know, did get predated, um, which was unfortunate. So it was, it was, it was several nests were put into it, but none of them were successful because it got predated. We have since put a better predator guard on that box. Um, so hopefully that will happen. Again. All right, anything else before we close? No? Everybody's good? Okay, well, thank you again for all coming and for considering this. Um, the more folks we have participating, the better. And, um, you know, let me know by um, close of business Wednesday, if you would, if you, if you want to continue. All right, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thanks again for coming. Thank, Thank you so much, you. Diane. Thank you. Thank you. Diane. Thank you, everybody. It was great. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.